All right. Hello, everybody. Um, welcome. Uh, glad you're able to uh, stick with us here on the last afternoon. Um, uh, my name is John Bellamerick. I'm from Google, and this is my uh, former colleague, uh, Yang uh, from Avanti. And we're going to talk to you a little bit about uh, what's been happening in the CordiaNS project and um, how you can build your own plugins. So I guess just to give a brief overview, what is CordiaNS? I mean, it's a DNS server. Most of you probably know it um, from its being in most Kubernetes uh, clusters out there. But actually, it's a standalone DNS server that existed um, before it was part of Kubernetes. Um, and uh, the idea is that we wanted a DNS server that, you know, bind is written, it's, it's probably going on 40 years old. Yes. Um, and it's, you know, written in C, and it's got uh, a lot of CVEs. Um, there are countries that have banned it, literally, because it's so, um, so, so many CVEs over the years, and the architecture is complicated. So um, the founder of CodeDNS, who is quite familiar with DNS um, and Go, he uh, decided that writing, write, rewriting a DNS server in a memory safe language was a good idea. Uh, and that's where we ended up, how uh, we ended up here. Um, as part of that, uh, there were also decisions made around how to structure it to be a little more flexible. So this was um, around 2015, 2016. And you know, it was during the, um, you know, the, the sort of container wars that were going on between Kubernetes and some other um, products, which we don't remember anymore. And um, the uh, and, and so um, I was involved in that process. I think I think it was a little bit before you got involved, Young. But yeah. we 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 saw Kubernetes and we said, look, uh, the current way Kubernetes is doing DNS has a lot of issues, and we think we can do it better. So we approached the the um, SIG network here and we started to get involved in. Um, uh, adapt CordiaNS to have its Kubernetes plugin, and eventually, then uh, over the next year or so, we became a part of the default installations of Kubernetes, and that's why um, you've probably seen us all over there. But that said, the Kubernetes plugin is just one of many. Um, we have uh, plugins that can handle different kinds of backends, so the the sort of structure of CordiaNS architecture is that there are servers on the front end, and there's a few different protocols for that. And then that gets fed into a, a, a plug-in chain. And I think you'll probably cover some of this when you do your demo. Yes. But um, that gets fed into a plug-in chain. And um, that each plug-in operates independently on the request or on the response as it goes back down through the chain in the other direction. Um, and those plugins can do different things, like mutate the request or mutate the response. They can answer the, the query from a back end, from a, either a database or in-memory cache, or say a cache of the Kubernetes services. So that very flexible architecture uh, allows you to do a lot of clever things. Um, and uh, that's what we needed in this sort of cloud native environment that was rapidly evolving uh, around uh, seven or eight years ago. Um, we have a very welcoming, uh, small but welcoming community. We have close to 400 contributors, but um, it's, you know, that's over many years, and a lot of people come in and add a plug-in here, add a plug-in there, and there's just a handful of people that continue to keep the project going uh, on a broader basis, so we'd love to get some of you out there. This is a maintainer track session. Come and be maintainers. We could, we'd love to have you with us. But um, we also have, um, we have close to 30 maintainers, but a lot of those are like, for, they'll be like, I maintain this one plugin, as opposed to maintaining the whole thing. So we can definitely use more help. Um, the 36 public adopters is probably way low compared to our actual adopters because we're also in millions of Kubernetes clusters. Recently, um, meaning three days ago, we had our 1.11.4 release. Um, and that uh, had some bug fixes, um, bumped the Debian version of the, um, um, the, the container image. Um, and there are a bunch of new features. We sort of gave the new features here from the last major release or so, um, just to give a, a flavor of what's happened recently. Um, in the latest release, we have uh, this new option for forward. So for many, uh, 
forward is a sort of a, a, a way that DNS, uh, that Core DNS works as a proxy. So this is used in, in, in um, if you use lo node local DNS um, in Kubernetes, it's, you have a Kubernetes, uh, you have a Core DNS on the node, it forwards to the central Core DNS, or of course when you, uh, Core DNS isn't actually a recursive name server, it doesn't have a recursive resolver, it just caches, but it will forward to a recursive name server and then cache the result locally. So that's what the forward plugin is, is does, and um, we've for a long time had another plugin called Alternate that allows you to tweak the behavior based on the response code you get back from the upstream recursive resolver. So if you get a, a, no, a no errors, or if you get no data, or you get you know, a, a serve failed, you can like try a different server, things like that. So that's been integrated into the forward plugin as opposed to being an external plugin, which, which it was before. Um, a number of other smaller changes. Um, rewrite, the last one I'll just mention here, uh, is a plugin um, that's pretty unique to, Kubernetes, to Core DNS, as far as I know, and that's where it allows you to, to mutate the request or the response. So some interesting use cases for that that we've shown in the past, and you can go to the Core DNS site and see the blog, are, in, for example, in Kubernetes, um, if you want to access some service, uh, and it could be running local in your cluster, or it could be, say, at a, a fully qualified domain name, Maybe you have a test version of it that you run locally in your, your cluster, but when you go to production, it's going to be an FQDN. You can actually use rewrite uh, to allow your application to always use the FQDN, and you can rewrite it to the local service name, and then it gets rewritten back, and TLS will still work. So those are kind of the little, little clever things you can do when you get into the, the, the DNS stream that you are really pretty challenging to do otherwise. So I'm going to talk a little bit more about one particular long-standing issue we've had, though, and that is um, that more cores does not equal more QPS. So what you're seeing here is a, uh, a, a chart showing, and obviously we stopped testing this particular thing after six CPUs, but the rest will become late, relevant later. You can see that this is basically using DNS perf, which is a DNS performance testing tool, to query a, D, a core DNS server and see how many QPS we can we can, uh, we can handle and uh, based on the number of CPUs we have. And the, in this particular machine, one CPU is giving us about 35,000 QPS. Um, this is only with cache, so basically what we're testing is our, right, our ability to, to decode and respond via cache, um, not the performance of an upstream server, which isn't very useful to, to for our uh, internal performance. So we peaked at about 40K QPS. Um, and as you added more CPUs, we actually started to decline because of some sort of contention. So, so what is that contention? We can take a look at the uh, way Core DNS does its internal request handling to see if we can figure that out. So this was all done uh, by two Maintain, or two, two contributors who aren't maintainers, they just came in, they're, they're users of the Core DNS, they're like, I'm trying to scale this thing and I'm having trouble, I can horizontally scale it, right? You could create multiple Core DNS instances, but if you've got a large Kubernetes cluster, that's a lot of memory, right? Each of those ones caches all the services and endpoints uh, so that it can respond appropriately, and so if you've got a very large cluster with a lot of services and endpoints, each one can take up a lot of memory. It sure would be nice if we could get the performance out of one. So um, one contributor identified some of the issue and another one came along with a solution. So it's, it's pretty cool to see the community come together, even not people who are like doing this day to day, but, but it came and contributed quite a bit. So in any case, um, the way Core DNS works internally, inside the Core DNS process, you have uh, a, a structure called a server, and that basically handles um, dispatching requests off of the socket um, to different Go routines which individually process the requests. Um, so what the first uh, contributor did is said, hey, I wonder if the, 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 the bottleneck is somewhere in this, in this process. And so uh, he actually just created another socket on a different port and tried to spray the requests across both of those ports. And lo and behold, the aggregate QPS basically doubled. So what that told us is pretty quickly that, that the problem is, right, it's somewhere right in this, in this little um, multiplexing across these, these, these sockets. So um, 
after doing a little bit, uh, you know, it's not practical to have users use port 54, right? Like nobody's going to use that. It's not going to work. So we needed a way to make it work um, uh, with just one port, our standard DNS port. And uh, so um, the other contributor came in, started playing with this, and discovered the real problem was actually with the, uh, the way that we read from the sockets, and that by using SO reuse port, which allows us to open multiple sockets on the same port, and uh, let the kernel distribute the packets across those different sockets, um, he could take exactly the same structure that we had with multiple ports, but just use multiple sockets. And um, so basically combining that with the, uh, with the internal changes so that the server, the one, one server block in our configuration could be configured to create multiple sockets on that same port. Um, we, uh, we, we found a, a nice solution. I'll show you what, what we see. So um, if we start with the QPS we had without the multi-socket plugin, or this is with the multi-socket plugin, but with it, the, the number of sockets set to one, um, you see exactly the same performance as before. But if we go to two sockets, you can see that with, uh, we, you know, we scale pretty well up until we get to five CPUs, and then uh, we, we, we drop off at six CPUs, so we're starting to hit the, the contention. Um, if we go to uh, three sockets, now we are looking at a close to linear progression. Uh, four sockets, five sockets, right? Eight sockets, all the way to 10 sockets, it's almost linear. So what this means is that one core DNS process, one instance running on one machine, given 14 CPUs, can do uh, 350,000 queries per second. So that's a pretty good rate, um, and we're, we're pretty proud of that. So uh, very happy with, with the results of this, um, but what's its status? Uh, it is not yet available uh, in a release, but it is merged into our uh, master branch, and will be in the 1.12 release, which we hope to release uh, on the order of weeks, uh, if not days. Of course, you have to set the reuse port, SO reuse port. Um, but uh, very simple to configure. You just put the word multi-socket in your server stanza, and it will actually default to the number of sockets uh, that uh, you have processors. That's why we added the, the auto max proxy. If you, if you know anything about Go in containerized environments, um, Go would still see all the CPUs, and so uh, Uber developed this thing where you just include it in your, your Go, your Go uh, program, and it automatically will set the environment variable that tells your, your, pro your application how, much, uh, how many CPUs are based upon what's available in that, in that container. So um, all you have to do is type multi-socket. That defaults the number of sockets to the number of CPUs available, and that seems to be a great default. It, you might be able to do a little bit better by tuning it, and in that case, you can put a static number there, but that's going to depend on a lot of details of your server, and, and you're going to need to empirically test that. So this seems to be a great default. Um, all right, with that, um, I will let uh, Yang take over. OK, uh, thanks, Zhang. OK, uh, Zhang, give us an uh, excellent update on multi-socket plugin, which uh, it's uh, definitely fantastic. Uh, many people probably gonna ask questions, okay, so yes, this is a great, there's a new plugin available, we can use it, but I also have some interesting features I want to utilize or I want to explore, but it's not available, or there's no plugin available for me, what, what should I do? Uh, the answer, as we mentioned, uh, CoreDNS is a plugin-based architecture, and it's fairly easy to extend the CoreDNS any way you want as long as you know how to write it in Go. And we are going to give you a, a demo plugin that can do a lot of things with a very simple, you know, like uh, maybe like less than 100 lines of uh, Golang uh, code to, to achieve the goal. So the, the demo plugin we are going to talk about is uh, a source IP based service discovery. We use this one a lot because uh, this is, turns out to be a uh, frequently uh, requested feature. Uh, many people say they have a special need for uh, return different, uh, let's say, DNS record based on, for example, based on source IP, based on certain flags, or based on, you know, like uh, 
uh, masking certain, you know, certain IPEs uh, depending on how they want. But they, there have been a lot of proposals to say to add a plugin into the coding as we didn't, uh, you know, take those plugins mostly because we realized the need uh, has been very diversified across different uh, you know, different uh, groups, different people from the community. Because some people say they want source IP based, they want like a side block based, they want uh, to you know handle special situations, and it's harder to consolidate everyone's request into like one robust plugin. But now we give you a, uh, give a demo plugin such that you can decide what you want to do, and you can write some simple uh, Golang programming to make it happen with your own, right? So the the demo plugin will do exactly just one thing. It will return a different IP based on the source IP. Uh, in, our, in, in this demo plugin, everything has been simplified. So let's say uh, your DNS server, you have DNS server, your DNS server receive a request from either internal network or external network. Uh, and you have, a re, you have a feature request say, if it's internal, I want to return one IP. If it's, uh, 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 if it's internal, I want to return one, uh, uh, one IP for certain DNS queries. And if it's external, I want to return another IP. That's all. Uh, of course, if it's uh, internal, we can, we can just hypothetically say the internal network is 172.0.0.0 slash 8, which just makes things a little easier. Of course, you can have some other options, but you can figure out fairly easily once you see the code, right? So we saw, uh, we're going to go directly jumping into the code. So if you say, okay, what do you need to do? You need to do two things. Uh, normally, if you're going to write a plugin, you will start up with like uh, two files, two Golang files. The first Golang file is the setup.go, which is to set up a, a one-time initialization as well as uh, to pass the configuration. In this case, since uh, uh, it's, it's more like a demo plugin, so we are going to make a configuration a little easier, so there's nothing to configure, but still you have to uh, write, a, write a function to pass the core file. So you have two functions in the setup.go. You have a init, that's a one-time initialization. You have a setup, which is the, uh, more like a stub setup. Uh, in the demo.go, that's another file, uh, you will need to process the DNS queries based on the description uh, from the previous slide. Uh, there's only one function you need to handle, that is the self DNS. Uh, this self DNS function will process DNS request and if it will return a uh, response. Or if you say, I'm not interested in this uh, request and I don't know how to handle that. If you don't know, you can just uh, let it pass uh, to the next plugin. So next plugin will pick up the request and decide what to do. So uh, as, as we explained, uh, core DNS is a it's a plugin-based architecture. The plugin is chained together. Uh, so if one plugin uh, pick up and process, it will stop. But if, uh, if the plugin decided to uh, skip, then the next plugin in, in the order will pick up and process. Okay. So now let's check the code. As I mentioned, the code is fairly straightforward and simple. So you have an init function, which uh, is bare, uh, it's a bare bone, uh, a start function to initialize the plugin, that's all. So we call it a demo. Uh, you can name it any, any, name, any name you want. Uh, and then the next function is a setup. Uh, the setup, depending on your, your configuration, it may be a little convoluted, but here we are not going to have any configurations because we just have hard code. Uh, some of the uh, hard code the uh, private IPs and the side blocks, so we, we are going to just uh, just to do a, a stop setup. So you see like several lines, and that's all you need to, to get the setup.go. The next file you need is the demo.go, which will consist of the, the, the majority of the processing. The processing is also simple. Uh, as, as we mentioned, uh, self DNS is the only function you need to process the DNS queries. So you have a self DNS function here. Uh, it will take a, a a message uh, as well as the response writer. Uh, response writer. Uh, the message, uh, you can pass a message to figure out what it is. Of course, you can find out the, the first line, the state is to try to get a state, and the second line of queue name is to figure out the, the, 
the query name. So if it's example.org or example.com or some other names, you can decide what to do. But here, we don't care about queue name. We are only going to return a different IP based on the source IP. OK, now here, as you can see, the next two lines will try to process the the source IP based on to see if its source IP is internal or external. If it's internal, okay, it's 172, start with 172, or start with 122, okay, so that means it's internal. So let's just return a, a static IP of 1.1.1.1. Uh, Otherwise, you know, as, as the previous line indicate, that's 8.8.8.8. .8 .8 .8. uh, th th so of course, that uh, that will capture uh, different uh, scenarios to process the uh, DNS. And then we have a final line uh, for uh, printf, which is <laughs> doing nothing other than just uh, let you see what is happening. Okay, and well, that's, uh, and after that, you can just decide if you are going to uh, stop processing, or you say you're, you're not interested, you're going to pass through. Okay, that should be the demo plugin's uh, Golang code. Now you say how to invoke this plugin. In order to invoke this plugin, you need to add additional entries in the core file. As, as, uh, as many of you know, uh, coding as uh, configuration is based on the, you know, on the core file, and the core file will, uh, uh, core file, you have to specify which plugin you're going to use. In our case, uh, we only want this plugin. We don't want anything else, so you only uh, specify demo plugin. But in case you want to combine this plugin with some, something else, you have to uh, add additional content to this core file. But we are going to skip this part for sure. But as, as you can see, it's fairly straightforward. Now, we have, every, we have everything configured, but then there are additional steps you have to do. Uh, inside the coding, as there is a so-called plugin.config, which uh, is needed in order to uh, grab the, the code you wrote to, to be part of the, the build, uh, the, uh, uh, the coding as build. Without uh, you know, uh, making a change in plugin.config, uh, your code will not be captured, so you have to add a demo, call and demo to plugin.config. Now the next thing is, of course, it's going to build, uh, uh, build coding as into a binary and the joint. So building coding into binary, if you are very familiar with how Golang works, you probably can figure that out with the different command lines. But we decided to make it a little simple. You can, you see a very, very long line of a Docker command, but if you can just run this one, it will take out everything and your plugin will be built into part of the coding as and it's ready to go. And once you uh, build a, build a, uh, Coding as with your plugin uh, to generate the binary, you can just invoke a coding as uh, dot slash coding as, and uh, it's up and running, and it will be ready to serve the uh, service-based, uh, 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 no, the source IP-based service discovery. And uh, uh, finally, we made the demo plugin available. So this is uh, you know the URL. You can take a look. Uh, if you check the content, you realize you're going to realize this. Uh, this repo is extremely simple. Uh, the last time I checked, that's only like 80 lines of code. So that's simple enough for you to write even <laughs> coding a plugin. So as, as I explained, you know, as also John explained, uh, coding as is a, a very unique community with a lot of contributors, many contributors. Uh, initially, they thought they need to do a lot of work, but then they realized, okay, they, they want to add certain features, and they realized <laughs> they, Everything is so simple. In fact, some of the major uh, plugins are written by some of the contributors only like done like once. You know, some, some, some contributors spend maybe like a couple of weeks. They contribute, for example, like a, a Google Cloud DNS plugin, so which is pretty significant, used by many people. So as, as I mentioned, uh, at the end of the day, if you're interested in uh, adding some features to extend the core DNS, uh, and you realize the features is not there, you can definitely tr give a try on the demo plugin and you can check this uh, URL to see if uh, it's something you need. And you can certainly make any modifications the, any way you want. You can even make it uh, to a little fancy with, uh, for example, passing the core file. But we, we're going to skip this part for this session. Um, so I think that's almost it. But 
uh, as a final, uh, you know, as a final statement, that we, according as it's a very welcoming community, so we certainly uh, welcome all kind of contribution. You can do all uh, different levels of contributions. Uh, at the minimum, if you haven't done, uh, haven't started coding as in GitHub, you can certainly try to do so, and that will increase the star count for sure. Uh, if your enterprise, your or your institution use coding as, and your let's say your CEO or institutions head is now the uh, uh, blocking from making the name public and certainly add a name to adopters.md that will you know, certainly make a small impact, at least that you can create a PR yourself, and that will also make you to be qualified as a contributor of coding already, right? And of course, uh, you can also try to become a maintainer. Uh, the, the requirement to become a maintainer uh, for coding community is ex extremely simple. All you need to do is to make one significant pull request. Okay, if you say, okay, you have a one, some, some idea about adding a small plugin, and if you can get some agreement with uh, other maintainers, you can create this uh, pull request and you are a maintainer, right? So that is, uh, I think that's all, so I, I think that's all. Yeah, let's uh, go to the Q&A session. Can we turn on the mic for the questions? Okay. Check, check. There we go. Okay. Go figure. It works a lot better when it's on. Um, hey, awesome presentation, guys. Thank you. Uh, I'm a, a recovering by 9 administrator as well. Can, can you move a little closer to the mic? It's a little harder. Uh, yeah, awesome presentation, guys. Thank, Thank you. you. Um, I'm a recovering by 9 administrator myself. So I uh, appreciate the earlier comments. Um, so is there like a process or where do you guys hang out and, and just chat? Um, sure. Really curious because some projects like to see, uh, hey, get some agreement on this pull request before you go through the trouble of writing this extension or this plugin or whatever. Uh, could you say a couple of words about that? Um, I think I caught what you said. You're asking where, like as a community, you can ask questions or maybe even say, should I contribute this or is there a plugin that does this? Because one thing I don't think exactly. we mentioned was that there's many external plugins and we will publish links to them on our website. Um, so uh, even if we don't build them into the core DNS organization in GitHub or even uh, more, more so, we, we're, we have ones that the, the, the core maintainers have made, but we still don't put them into the, the default set. So you can ask questions about that. We're on a, we have a Slack channel on the CNCF Slack, not the Kubernetes Slack, but the CNCF Slack, um, core DNS. Um, that's where you could get like interactive contact, um, but then it's issued on GitHub. So those are really the two places. Okay, awesome, thanks guys. Yeah, I, I, do, I do want to add one thing. One of the reasons we actually encourage you know, any, any new plugin to be like an external plugin for us, it's not because we try to push people aside. It's actually because we, we do want to make sure if a plugin is added to the main plugin, it's well maintained. You know, we don't know someone of sudden show a lot of interest, spend maybe like a couple of weeks, say, hey, I have a great idea. I'm going to uh, contribute to a plugin, and this one is merged, and then, you know, like three months later, if we say, okay, so someone need to fix the bug or do something, then we cannot find anyone to maintain it. That's only limitations, that's why we, if you want to introduce a new plugin to the main repo, we, we do want to, you know, to, to see if uh, there's some process to make sure it's well covered for the future, right? Thank you. Thanks, guys, for a good talk. I'm, uh, I have a mildly technical question. Uh, one of, I'm imagining that other Kubernetes administrators also have this problem of in-dots <laughs> DNS amplification. <laughs> yes. And when you have developers that you don't have control over and they don't set up their end dots correctly and so it just creates this like amplification of DNS queries. Has there been any discussion perhaps on the core DNS side of maybe a plugin or a configuration that can help reduce that problem or improve caching or something like that? Yes. Um, in fact, we have a plugin for a number of years now um, called um, 
Oh my gosh, I can't remember the auto uh, auto pass. Uh, auto pass, yes. Yeah, so so it was specifically designed because of this problem, and there's some gotchas, right? But so so I guess to maybe a bit to, to to back up one second, part of the problem is the way the Kubernetes um, DNS schema was designed. Uh, the idea was that you could say I'm looking for you know service foo, and it would look in your namespace first, and then if it, it if it didn't find it there, you know it would it sort of like goes through this chain of of requests to try and determine where it is and try and find it. And that means a bunch of requests. And there's actually nothing really Core DNS can do about that because that's all client-side resolver behavior. However, um, we do do one little clever thing. And we have this Autopath um, uh, plugin that basically uh, tries to detect just by the form of that, um, that uh, query, the initial query you'll get, that's sort of wrong, and we'll, um, we'll basically map it back to I I an existing service and um, send a C name. And so uh, it works really well, actually. There's weird little edge cases where like, if you have like a, a com namespace, right, you can get cases where you break <laughs> things. Like, that, that's not fully deterministic. It's, yeah. it's the way that it, it guesses that this is an autopath query is not fully deterministic, so you could screw it up or somebody could mess with namespaces to, to, to make you get wrong answers sometimes. But for most people, it's fine. And in fact, if you go on the cordiness.io, you'll find a blog entry and we talk about autopath and you'll see a chart there where it was, um, I don't know if it was SoundCloud or somebody implemented this and like it was like the number of queries like dropped, you know, you just like it's, in, it's incredible. You can see the graph right out of the metrics. So it's pretty cool. You might be a lifesaver for me. Thank you very much. <laughs> Absolutely. Glad, yeah. glad to help. <laughs> uh, we just have a couple minutes left. Any more questions? Okay. Uh, no. uh, so I just wanted to clarify the plugins are compiled directly into the Core DNS binary. Is that correct? Yes, um, so that is a perennial thorn in our sides. Like, the plugins are compiled in and they're in fixed order. So regardless of the order you specify them in your server block, um, the request will be processed in the order that they're compiled in in the plugin.cfg. So we've talked about changing that. You know, certainly the ordering would be something fairly easy to change. The, Compiled in nature is not as easy to change, although it's possible today with Go. It wasn't when we originally, um, when Cordius was originally created. But there's caveats, as I understand it. I haven't really looked deeply into it. So, um, yes, is the short answer. Yeah, OK. Thank you. I have a question. Uh, about the cache plugin, currently the limit is uh, around 10K. I wonder, like, uh, if why you don't consider to extend this limit? Is there any reason for it? I don't know. Is it, it's really it's it's capped at ten k at ten thousand cache entries. Yeah, if you like uh, just uh, now Google the uh, cache, which is as a front end cache plugin. This is uh, just uh, around ten k, which is the limit. Um, yeah, I can't think of any really great reason. Uh, that that was done, or why we wouldn't change it if we did adequate testing. So, if it's something you're you're interested in doing, the cache is a little that that number is a little funny. Like it's, as I recall, it's about the number of entries, and the entries can number be different sizes. So you you actually it doesn't really correlate directly with memory. It's sort of indirect based on the size of your responses. Yeah, yeah. I, I did a um, very rough calculations that 10 k probably take around uh, two megabytes. Uh, memory. So if we can extend that, I see it's a pretty, like, uh, I, I don't see the limitation. So that's why asking. Uh, the other question about the multi-cluster uh, plugin. So if uh, logically, this is a, uh, we can just extend the clusters, right? But uh, do we have any um, performance, like, evaluation? Will this have any uh, regression if there is a goes to too many objects or clusters? So um, there's, the, 
I have to go back and look at what, when you say multi-cluster plugin, we have something we call the uh, Kubernetes, like, like uh, I don't think it's really the Greek plural, but it's, we, we thought it was a clever name. Is that what you're talking about, or are you talking about one that handles multi-cluster services? Multi-cluster so, services. Okay, so the, 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 the Kubernetes one is like, you can actually have a single query instance that talks to multiple API servers and maps them to different uh, FQDNs, um, which is useful for headless services if you've got a fabric that they can route them. But um, for multi-cluster, I actually don't know much about it. Um, what we do, though, I will say is that uh, early on, very early on, when we wanted to become the default, uh, one of the things that we were asked to do is make sure that our memory profile was similar to the existing KubeDNS at the time. And what we ended up doing to make that work is that, I don't know how much you know about Kubernetes development, but there's, there's caches of the objects right in, in yes. uh, from the Kubernetes API server. And if you just use the standard client libraries, it caches the whole object. But we actually only need like two fields. Right? So what we do is we actually rewrite those and just stuff them in our own cache. We have our own informer cache format that's much, much smaller. We were able to dramatically reduce. So, so while th there is potentially, um, obviously you, the more clusters you talk to, the more, um, or the, rather the more objects you import, the larger your memory footprint's gonna get. We do a lot to try and make it as small as possible. I don't know if that's been implemented with the service import export things or whether we need to even track those. I wasn't involved in that, that plugin development, so I'm not quite sure. Do you know anything about it? Yeah, unfortunately, no. I see, thank you, thanks a lot, great sure. talk. Okay. Hello, I have related questions to, question to Cash. Um, maybe it's better to ask AWS EKS team, but I'll ask you. So, what, uh, do you know what was the reason why they set cache 30 seconds TTL by default in their core DNS? Um, so that is the default we generally use, um, which um, I don't remember why that was chosen. It was a number of years ago, but it's a as I recall, it's a, um, yeah, it, it, it basically uh, overrides TTL overrides DNS TTL. records. Like but it, it have, only shortens it, right? It doesn't lengthen it. Yeah, it shorts. Yeah. Like if I have one hour TTL, it will set 30 seconds. Yeah, I don't know why we thought that was a good idea, honestly. Um, but it's, it's uh, you, could, you could crank it up in your environment and see what it, see if you get any uh, worse behavior. Yeah, and I don't see the reason why would you need to shorten it. Like, if you have some public DNS record, why would you keep it? I, I suspect it was, so I think, I think Meek did that, who was the founder of the project a long time ago, and I'm, if I had a guess, I would say it's something like, well, we're not really a, a, like a, a, a recursive DNS server, and um, we're not gonna get things like zone transfers, even if we're authoritative. Well, I don't know. I don't know, actually. I honestly don't know why <laughs> okay. he, he did that. It was... That, that was way many years ago. Yeah, this would've, that would've been six, five or six years ago, at least. Yes. So we'll have to look into that for you. Okay. If you can reach out on the Slack, we can see if we can start a debate or create an issue. Okay. Yep, I think we're out of time. Thank you all. Okay, thanks.